In the waning hours of February 5th, 2017, a lone thief broke into one of the most heavily guarded, highly attended events in the world to carry out one of the most daring heists in American history. And he did this without firing a single shot, picking a single lock, or cracking a single safe. The thief didn't repel from the ceiling like a cat burglar in a black ninja outfit. Instead, he wore a plain gray suit. The thief carefully made his way around the would-be crime scene and, rather easily, completed the heist. He then quietly turned and walked right out the front door with a missing garment worth $500,000. It was the jersey worn by Tom Brady in Super Bowl 51. The theft of Tom Brady's jersey triggered what was undoubtedly the most furious response to a missing garment in the history of law enforcement. The Houston Police Department, Texas State Law Enforcement, and NFL Security all rushed to investigate. The Lieutenant Governor of Texas lent his weight and would call upon the services of the legendary Texas Rangers. The crime would draw in border agents, federales, and diplomats on both sides of the U.S.-Mexican border. And even a legion of cyber sleuths joined in the hunt for the missing jersey. But according to the FBI, investigators weren't looking for a jersey at all. They were trying to track down a piece of art. This is the lead. Audible Originals presents a Joy Road Entertainment production. I'm your host, Richard Sherman. As memorabilia goes, the NFL is far from the juggernaut it is on the field. But after February 5th, 2017, interest in one piece of NFL memorabilia was about to skyrocket. Shares Gary Grambling of Sports Illustrated. It was one of the most Tom Brady-ish games you could possibly imagine. If you just say 28 to 3 in the football world, everyone knows exactly what you're talking about. Spoiler alert. Everyone knows that Tom Brady led the Patriots on a furious comeback that ended in the first overtime win in Super Bowl history. But just hours into the wake of that epic comeback, in all of the chaos of the celebration and the media circus that covered it, the man who had not just been the face of a dynasty, but the league for nearly 20 years, discovered a problem. Yeah, I put it in my bag and then I came out and it wasn't there anymore. Tom Brady's Super Bowl jersey was missing. For Brady, there was a horrible feeling of deja vu. Just two years earlier, the winning jersey he had worn in Super Bowl 49 against my Seattle Seahawks had gone missing. A jersey that would be worth a lot less if we decided to run the ball instead of passing on the goal line. But this time was different. This time, Tom Brady was seized with the feeling that his jersey hadn't just been misplaced. It was gone. And at 9.13 p.m. that night, the NFL tweeted out to the world, hey, can somebody give us back Tom Brady's jersey? The next day, Monday, February 6th, the Houston Police Department filed an official police report listing the theft as a first-degree felony, and the complainant was Tom Brady. The value of the stolen jersey was put at $500,000. Although the jersey's value certainly drew the FBI's interest, there was another reason for the Bureau's involvement explains former FBI agent Robert Whitman, who remains the definitive authority in missing, stolen, or forged property. When we talk about art, you know, we're going to talk about art, such as paintings, prints, sculptures. When I refer to art, I'm talking about cultural property. And cultural property is everything. That's Batmobiles, it's antique cars, it's Asian antiques, it's sports memorabilia. Whether it's a Mayan vase or an Incan mask or a Tom Brady rookie card. It's all part of the cultural property program. In other words, Tom Brady's Super Bowl winning jersey is considered a work of art by the FBI. Monday, February 15th. It's a typical week after the Super Bowl in Boston, which means another ticker tape parade down Boylston Street, their fifth since 2002. But for investigators meeting in a private Gillette Stadium conference room, the mood was anything but celebratory. A winter storm had disrupted their schedule, stranding Houston police investigators in Texas and delaying the most important piece of evidence for their investigation, 
the USB drive containing over one terabyte of raw footage of the Patriots locker room the night of the Super Bowl, says Dave McCain of NFL Security. Worked on identifying who had video through our security reps. We tracked down where that video was, but we were able to get the video and then it was shipped to Foxborough. Investigators will have to find that smoking gun by combing through hundreds of hours of footage from security cameras, Fox Sports, and even cell phones to look for something, anything. As they did this, other members of their team sifted through suspects among the over 20,000 people credentialed for the Super Bowl, including media, vendors, and security. And back in Houston, police continued to chase other leads. We've been uh, getting a lot of media calls in the office uh, this morning with information about this case. Our investigators actually developed information from uh, an informant here in Houston. It had been over a week and some of the country's finest investigators still had not come up with one suspect. The furious nationwide search had sent the thief deep underground. Little did they know he would soon come up for air in one of the sports world's strangest and most lucrative subcultures. The world of sports memorabilia. The demand just skyrocketed. When I was collecting, look, I was doing it in my basement. You know, I didn't really, you know, I wasn't going to go out and get dates by telling people, oh, I, I collect sports cards. I mean, it wasn't hot. It wasn't cool. You know, there weren't advertisements on TV. I mean, now it has really become popular. Ken Golden is the founder of Golden Auctions, the world's largest distributor of sports memorabilia. If you Google Ken Golden today, you'll find pictures of him posing with Drake or Logan Paul, but that wasn't always the case. At one time, the memorabilia industry was a wild west of forgeries, felons, and fortunes. But now it's a highly organized billion dollar industry. In the late 70s and early 80s, collectors were in the tens of thousands. Now they are in the tens of millions. 10% or less are novices, you know, people who want something of their favorite player or want one item. The other 90% is made up of serious collectors, dealers, and pure investors. Literally, when I say a pure investor, I mean somebody who honestly does not have an emotional attachment to the item. They are buying it the same way they would buy Microsoft stock at its high profile uh, prices, whether it is $9 million from Arizona Jersey, whether it's $7 million for a baseball card or $3.6 million for a Kobe Bryant Jersey. It comes in all shapes and sizes. And that's at the high end. But collecting doesn't stop there. We've sold some uh, very unusual items. We have sold the jock strap that Joe Frazier wore in the fight of the century. There have been uh, dentures of Ty Cobbs that have been sold. They've sold bathroom signs out of Yankee Stadium, urinals. We've sold the glove that Bill Buckner was wearing when the ball rolled under his glove in game six of the 1986 World Series. Whether you want your hero's rookie card or his underwear, Golden Auctions is the premier place to look. But in any industry where there's vast amounts of money, there's also a criminal underbelly. And just like art, sports memorabilia is vulnerable to forgery. We spoke to former FBI agent Timothy Fitzsimmons, one of the architects behind Operation Bullpen, the FBI's largest sting operation in the history of sports collectibles. What gets forged is the high ticket item but there's more scrutiny involved with those. So it's a trickier type of operation to forge those sorts of things. But that's what the forgers, they will forge the high ticket items. But when criminals can't forge, they look to get their hands on the real thing, which is why Ken Golden travels with the cadre of security. I walk around the national convention and I have people make a comment, why does Ken Golden always have a bodyguard? And also why he talks in the third person. Ken Golden could literally be walking something from his booth worth one to $15 million. We've got over 100 security cameras in the building. We have two armed guards with guns in both of our buildings. We have a vault that is state-of-the-art security and armed guards 24-7, 365. And he should. Sports memorabilia heists have skyrocketed in the last decade. After a thief was captured in this surveillance video, the owner says that the thief grabbed some of the rare rookie cards of Babe Ruth, Mickey Mantle, Michael Jordan, and others. Another one of the problems with stolen sports memorabilia is that oftentimes an athlete doesn't even know it's gone missing. 
eight-time Pro Bowler and superstar Buffalo Bills defensive end Von Miller didn't even know the helmet he had worn during Super Bowl 50 was gone till officials returned it to him after a raid. Almost two weeks after the heist, investigators still didn't have any clear suspects. However, they did have someone who may have been a person of interest. It was security footage of a man who appears to be walking out of the Patriots locker room with something under his arm. But investigators couldn't determine what or even who. What they did know was that the more time that passed, the less likely they were ever going to see that jersey again. What they didn't know was that 3,000 miles away in Seattle, Washington, a Boston-born teenager, an avid Patriots fan, had the answers. I was about 80% sure. Everybody I called at the time, all the law enforcement agencies, NFL, Patriots, I told them, hey, I'm not 100% sure that this guy has it, but there's a pretty decent chance. Dylan Wagner was born in Boston on March 20th, 1998, and was only three years old when Tom Brady won his first Super Bowl. Though he and his family would leave Boston for the Pacific Northwest when he was just five, love of the New England Patriots would never leave him. In his room at home in Seattle is a shrine to the team. So this guy here, this is just a normal like retail signed Gronk jersey. I got a super good deal on it. I'm a deal hunter myself. So I buy, sell, I swap it out on display. Here, this one took me about maybe five, six years to assemble the entire piece. The mannequin was really, that was a white whale for me. That's like the official Nike store mannequin. So they don't sell them. I went directly to the manufacturer. All corners of my room, I actually have more of these guys. I have a Brady one and I have a Gronk one. Matthew Slater, Pro Bowl, Devin McCourty's 26. 16 game worn color rush jersey brady signed piece right there when we beat the texans like 27 to 0 something crazy though dylan wagner loves the patriots it wasn't love that brought the team into collecting when i first started collecting it was strictly for money you know i would buy just a retail fan jersey and i would then go on ebay and sell it for money it basically funded my starbucks addiction while i was in high school being this super scrawny guy that I still am, I was even scrawnier then, the men's jerseys didn't fit me. So you can't buy like the super nice high quality jerseys and the kids sizes and then I don't want to be in high school wearing a kid's jersey. So I dabbled into the like game used team issued stuff and my first jersey was a Patrick Chung 2010 throwback jersey. And I put it on. I remember the first day I got it, I put it on. And I was like, holy cow, this is an amazing fit. You got the, the cuff sleeves and all that stuff. So I just increasingly started buying more and more of those for my own collection. And I picked up a Dion Branch team issue jersey from the Patriots. So I threw that item up on eBay. In December of 2018, it would be that same jersey that will lead the team to his first interaction with another collector from Mexico eBay and he messaged me and he was like, hey, I'm in Mexico, so eBay won't let me buy it directly through you. Can we take this transaction offline? And I was like, of course. I've done it before. It's not really a big deal. I cut out the eBay fees, save me some money, save him some money, and ended up buying the jersey from me. As typical with collectors, a kinship is formed during a transaction. It's pretty standard for a collector once you meet to show off your collection a little bit, be like, oh yeah, I have this item. And then they'd be like, oh, that's so crazy. You know, I have this item too. And that can either strike up a deal. You could do a trade, you could buy it, sell, whatever you want to do um, as far as transactions go. So he sends me about 30 photos and I think it was like buried into maybe like the 18th photo or something crazy. He was like, hey, did you see the Brady jersey? that I have. And I was like, no, I didn't see that. I must have missed it. So I go back through and I click at it and boom. It was Tom Brady's game-worn jersey from Super Bowl 49, the same jersey that had gone missing two years previous. However, Tom Brady had never reported that jersey as missing. So Dylan Wagner assumed its provenance was legitimate. After the call, excited to share the find, Dylan reached out to another collector friend of his out of Chicago. Super cool guy. I've been dealing with him since like the beginning of time. Also a collector. His name is Chris Aroni. I met Dylan through, I think it was an eBay sale, and he was just getting into the game-worn collecting field, and he was asking me a lot of questions. And I have a decent amount of experience in collecting game-worn jerseys. been probably doing it. 15, 20 years. So I showed him some photos of my collection and how I go about buying things and authenticating things. And 
you know, we maintained in, in touch. And then he had called and said, hey, you know, I, I, I sold the jersey to this guy in Mexico and he sent pictures of his collection and he said, look at the Tom Brady Super Bowl jersey he has in his collection. And I haven't seen it anywhere publicly come up for auction. So I didn't know if he was a friend or knew was someone close to Brady that he was able to acquire this jersey. Because to me, as a Tom Brady collector, having one of the Super Bowl jerseys would probably be the pinnacle of my collection. If authentic, the game-worn Tom Brady Super Bowl jersey would be the pinnacle of any collection. And as Dylan discovered, it was. The only way to know for sure is photo matching. It can take five minutes to do a photo match. It can take you days, months. You might never be able to photo match an item until 10 years down the line and you're scrolling through Instagram, Facebook, and you're like, wait, that might match my jersey. I was able to photo match it myself because on the back, the nameplate where it says Brady, there were some very distinct uh, grass stains that were like rippled uh, sequentially. And I was like, this is the real deal. And I was like, that's crazy. That's a piece that belongs in Brady's house, the NFL Hall of Fame, the Patriots Hall of Fame, anywhere but this dude in Mexico's basement. The dude's name was Martin Mauricio Ortega. But his name wouldn't cross Dylan's mind again until the day after Super Bowl 51. Well, my buddy texts me and he's like, hey, did you see this? Tom's missing one of his jerseys. It was Chris Aroni, Dylan's collector friend from Chicago. And I was like, no. So I, he sends me a link to an ESPN article all the way at the bottom. And it says, and it's the only article I was able to find that says this isn't the first time Brady's had a jersey stolen. He's missing his Super Bowl 49 one. And everything started turning in my brain. It would turn into Roni's brain as well. Because not only was he a collector, Chris Aroni also held another full-time job. I am an ATF special agent. I've been uh, employed with ATF since 2000, so I've been on the job 22 years. I started my career in Cleveland, Ohio, did my first eight years there, and then transferred back to the ATF Boston Field Division in 2009. And then recently, in the last several years, I transitioned over to uh, a program manager within ATF. Both immediately made the connection. Our brains started moving at the same exact time. They were like synchronized. And we were like, well, we probably should get this information to the authorities. Uh, and that's when we started reaching out to every law enforcement agency that would take us seriously. That's what Dylan did. One thing was, they didn't take him seriously. For starters, I reached out to the Houston Police Department. They had all their press conferences on it and it started blowing up the next day. And they didn't really take me seriously. They were like, oh, yeah, you know, just file a report with your local police department. And I was like, my little small town police department in Washington state doesn't care about Tom Brady's Super Bowl jersey for a crime that happened in Texas. So they kind of, you know, pushed me under the rug a little bit. Next would be NFL security. They also brushed it under the rug. They were like, yeah, this kid probably doesn't know who he's talking about. I'm 19 years old at the time. So what does a 19 year old know about a half a million dollar jersey? He then called the Patriots. Took a bunch of digging to find their phone number, but I got through to somebody and same situation. They were like, yeah, yeah. And they actually laughed. And I was like, okay, so you guys aren't taking me serious either. Even Dylan's own mother didn't believe him. I lived with my parents at the time. And I was like, no, mom, I'm telling you, this is, this is the real deal. This guy really has it. And she didn't believe that I actually held the key to the case in figuring out who stole it. Tom Brady released his own suspect board on social media. It included Julian Edelman, Lady Gaga, Jaws, and Gollum from Lord of the Rings. But Mauricio Ortega's name was not on there. At that point, Dylan Wagner's ATF agent friend, Chris Aroni, decided to nudge the investigation. So I reached out to Dylan and I said, I know from you having selling something to Ortega in Mexico, I said, give me his eBay user ID, his mailing address, whatever you have. I said, get me that information. And he got me all the information. And then I reached out to a special agent with the FBI out of the Chicago field office, Brian Brasokas, who I had had uh, some correspondence with. You know, I sent them all the information that Dylan provided me and I think me having that connection with Brian Brasokas with the FBI kind of facilitated things. It did. The FBI and other investigators then realized that the same person of interest they had seen leaving the locker room with something tucked under his arm was the same collector Dylan Wagner had sold a jersey to, Martin 
Mauricio Ortega. They immediately called Dylan. I get a call and it's just some out of area Illinois number. I'm like, what the heck? And I think I let it go to voicemail and he's like, hey, this is blah, blah, blah from the FBI. And I was like, oh crap. Okay, this is getting serious now. So from that point forward, I primarily worked with the FBI after they reached out to me to coordinate. I gave them the two addresses, forwarded them every email, every photo, I gave them access to my eBay account in case they needed anything off there. I forwarded I somehow, I guess, in the email HTML coding, there was an IP address, so they were able to pull that and all crazy stuff that federal agencies have access to. It was the smoking gun that the investigators had been looking for. And without it, there would have been no justifiable cause to pursue Ortega. Just watch the video. You wouldn't suspect him of anything. You have nothing. But there was still a problem. Mauricio Ortega was now safe in Mexico. Says reporter Gary Gramling, Back in 2017, obviously Donald Trump has just been inaugurated. His campaign was build the wall. We have this very precarious relationship between the two nations at this point, and the authorities from the U.S. call uh, the authorities from Mexico and say, can you go recover this guy's shirt? Suddenly, Tom Brady's jersey was at the center of an international incident. And for a moment, it looked like Ortega might actually get away with the football crime of the century. Obviously, this is a time in our country when our relationship with Mexico wasn't at its finest point. So they didn't want to make a massive deal like, hey, Mexico, we're going down there whether you like it or not. And Mexico didn't want the bad publicity either. So uh, I think they just kind of worked together to kind of keep it quiet. And they would keep it quiet for the next several weeks, while officials from both sides of the border would negotiate a deal. Until March 20th, Jay Glazer with Fox Sports broke the story. Here's where we stand now. We reported all this this morning that, in fact, they have found Tom Brady's jerseys. The date was not only significant for the culmination of the investigation, but it was also significant for Dylan Wagner. I remember getting a call on my birthday, and there was a voicemail. It was like 6 a.m. Uh, it was a call from the East Coast from like a 617 number, whatever the Boston area code is. The call went to Dylan's voicemail. It was New England Patriots owner Robert Kraft. Dylan, this is Robert Kraft from the New England Patriots. Just want to thank you for the great role you played in helping us get Tommy's jerseys back. So I get that phone call from Robert Kraft, and my mind is blown. You know, it's the greatest birthday present a Patriots fan could ever ask for. You get a call from the owner of the Patriots. So I was on cloud nine that entire day, week, and then all the interviews start happening. You know, TMZ, I think I did CBS in the morning, lots of radio interviews with local Boston stations, did a couple out here in Seattle, news stations out here in Seattle. So that's when my five minutes of fame really started to pick up for about the next month or so. Things would get even better for Dylan Wagner come that September when his New England Patriots would raise their Super Bowl 51 banner. And for the first time in his Patriots life, Dylan would be at Gillette Stadium for a game with field passes, compliments of Robert Kraft. So I'm standing in line at the Patriots Pro Shop right outside the stadium for them to open. And I see him walk up. It's Robert Kraft. This is the dude that just called me a few months back. He came over to me and they had all the news cameras there. And I got to meet and greet him. And I was like, can I give you a hug? And he's like, yeah, sure. So I, you know, I gave him a hug. There's a great photo on the internet somewhere of that happening. And then he gave me sideline passes. So I got to walk around the field prior to the game and, you know, while the banner was dropping. Dylan would also get to go to Robert Kraft's press conference. This is the young man who helped us get our jersey from the Super Bowl in Mexico. That's right. So we're honored to have him here. Thank you. Go Pats! Go Pats! 2,800 miles from Foxborough, in Mexico City, there was no happy ending for Mauricio Ortega. Ortega had been an executive of the Mexican newspaper Diario La Prensa, but was dismissed when they learned of the theft. Ortega would only speak once about the incident to NFL Films. My name is Martin Mauricio Ortega. My name is Martin Mauricio Ortega. And I took Tom Brady's Super Bowl jersey. Now that I've analyzed what happened, I think this is very similar or the same as an addiction. What I can tell you is that at no moment was it planned. It was an impulse from an uncontrolled fan. Tom Brady, accept my apologies. Tom Brady did accept Ortega's apologies. Well, apology accepted and 
this is something that I think we've all learned from. And though he could have, he would not press charges. Why? Because he's Tom Brady. But Ortega also found a soft spot with Dylan Wagner as well. I don't think I fault Ortega. No, that's not the right word because he was definitely in the wrong. But I could see how the guiltiness and him wanting to own one of the greatest pieces in all of history. I don't think there's a better jersey, NFL game worn jersey out there than that piece. So to just have such easy access to it, I can understand the temptation. However, would I do it? No. But I could understand you know, where he could want to do something like that in his mind frame at the time. Today, Dylan Wagner is no longer the teen who found Tom Brady's jersey. And though he's a grown man who was married and enlisted in the United States Air Force with the ambition of becoming an officer, he's still a huge Patriots fan and a collector. Most of my items, I tend to do all my research beforehand. Uh, there are items, you know, that'll pop up on eBay and it's super, it's a super good deal. I'll just pull the trigger. Or he will ask some NFL players if they're willing to part with any of their collectibles. Richard Sherman, he has a, a Wingstop franchise out here in Washington State. So uh, I drove out there one day. He was doing like a meet and greet autograph signing. And on a piece of paper, I wrote my phone number down. And I was like, hey, if you ever want to sell any of your game-worn memorabilia, hit me up. Of course, he just kind of laughs, takes it, and probably threw it away. No, I didn't throw it away, Dylan. And I think I might have something for you. For over 30 years, it was impossible to hear Boston and Heist in the same sentence and not think about the great Isabella Stewart Gardner robbery. When on March 17, 1986, thieves dressed as Boston police officers walked into the Gardner Museum. The gates at the Isabella Gardner Museum will stay locked while authorities search for clues in the daring weekend heist. There are some significant paintings missing. By significant, there's a couple of Rembrandts and a Vermeer. And walked out with over $500 million worth of art, including Rembrandt's only seascape. It was one of former agent Robert Whitman's first cases, one that he spent much of his career trying to solve, and one he's still haunted by. There's a reward out right now for information leading to the recovery of up to $10 million. I worked on that case, and I would love to get those paintings back. It's a shame because you're not just stealing a piece of property. You're stealing a piece of the heritage of the world. It's the cultural heritage of the world, and it's a piece of human genius. And it's a shame when we lose something like that. But as Whitman points out, there's also an irony when a great piece of art goes missing. The reason that people even know what the Mona Lisa is today just because it was stolen in the early 1900s. And at that time, it made worldwide news. People all over the world, front pages of all the newspapers, heard about the theft of the Mona Lisa. But as a result, it became the most famous painting in the world. In other words, we're really not interested in something until it's gone. Or perhaps there's something else. Something that cuts to the core of not just being a collector, but a fan. We spoke to art history professor Andrew McClellan about why these items matter to us. The psychology of collecting holds that people collect things as an extension of themselves, that objects represent a kind of buffer or extension between themselves and, and the outside world and represent some facet of their identity. Nostalgia can also play a factor. You know, you collect things that represent your past life, your childhood, things that were, were dear to you and have sentimental value. Maybe that's where sports memorabilia and art share some of the same DNA. Both evoke passion and sentimentality. Human beings have always had a natural affinity for superlative achievement and genius. We're very competitive creatures, and people who rise to the top for one reason or another hold great admiration. Leonardo, in his time, was vaunted by kings and dukes and princes, and they wanted his art, they wanted his services. So that sense of admiration for excellence or supreme achievement transfers easily into the realm of sports. It's something that transcends race, it transcends religion, it transcends you know, class, ethnic background, so it brings us all together. And nobody understands that more than appraisers like Ken Golden. You look at moments in history. I was mentioning Babe Ruth. Imagine having the bat that Babe Ruth was using when he hit the called shot in the 1932 World Series. Or imagine the jersey that Jackie Robinson wore 
the very first time he walked out onto a Major League Baseball field on April 15th, 1947, or the bat that Bobby Thompson used in 1951 playoff game that shot her around the world. And obviously, Tom Brady, you can't get more personal than the literal shirt off their back. Though Martin Mauricio Ortega was caught, he will never do hard time for executing the greatest memorabilia heist in American history, twice. Perhaps Tom Brady didn't want to give the story more attention. Perhaps he just wanted to put this ordeal behind him and move on with his life. Or perhaps, like Dylan, he had some shred of empathy for Ortega. Perhaps for a moment, he thought back to the days when he wasn't Tom Brady back when he was just a boy sitting in the stands of Candlestick Park, cheering on Joe Montana at the height of his powers, and wondering what it would be like to touch his boyhood idol's jersey. Because anybody who loves football or sports can relate to that feeling. That yearning to connect ourselves to the greatness we witness on the playing field, watching as a hero rises, transcending all earthly limitations to do the impossible overcoming all obstacles to obtain that elixir, uniting a city, a state, or even a country with their feats, and in the process, transforming an ordinary uniform into a piece of art. Thank you for listening. This has been an Audible Original, created by P.G. Kasheri. Produced by Audible Originals and Joy Road Entertainment. Neil Cabana, P.G. Kasheri, Matt Hatchett, and Jim Young. Executive producer, Nick D'Angelo. Written by Eli Lloyd. And I'm your host, Richard Sherman of Prime Video's Thursday Night Football. The production was designed, engineered, and mixed by Neil Cabana. Acquisition and Development, John Kim and Sonia Kim. Audible Legal Services, Whitney Marshall. Legal Services provided by Pierce Law Group, David Albert Pierce and Carter Courtney. Head of Audible Studios, Zola Mashariki. Joy Road Entertainment is PG Kasheri, Matt Hatchett, Bobby Glanton Smith, Tim Livingston and Jim Young. Special thanks go to Robert Whitman, Gary Gramling, Dave McCain, Ken Golden, Timothy Fitzsimmons, Dylan Wagner, Chris Arone, Robert Kraft, and Professor Andrew McClellan. <laughs>